Okay, well, oh my gosh, my heart is so full. I don't know where to begin. Seriously, I'm so blessed. It's difficult. It's difficult to be in my position. <laughs> oh, Lord, you're so, you're so wonderful. You're so amazing. I love you. I love you. And um, so many people wishing me well and messages. And every time I bump into someone, we're praying for you, Pastor Tony. I'm overwhelmed. This, this is just a church full of love. You know that? The love of God is manifest in here. You know why we're so happy? Because we have Jesus on the inside. You know, I'll say it again. Somebody said to me a few weeks ago, I reckon this must be the, the happiest church in the city. I said, well, you know what? I'll take that. I'll take that. That's fine. I, don't, I, I wish we're all, you know, I want us all to be happy. But, you know, I think, I think this must be not just the happiest church, but maybe, maybe this when we gather here on a Sunday, maybe this is the happiest place in the whole city. <laughs> Where? You know, tell me anything better. I, don't, I cannot think of any better place where there is love, joy, peace, hope, healing, love, you know, friendship. Come on. I mean, where else? Can, it doesn't get better than this. I'm just, I'm overwhelmed. I'm just blessed. I want to tell you, certainly, New Cross Hospital isn't happier than here at this place. That's for sure. <laughs> Lordy, Lordy, you are blessed. Just put your hand on your heart and say, I am blessed. Now, I want you to say that again. It's time to make a good confession. I am blessed. I am the blessed of God. I am a child of God. Every curse is broken. Every sin forgiven. Jesus has taken care of me. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my friend. Greater is He that is in me that is, than he that is in the world. And I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Amen. Amen. All oh, praise the Lord. Come on. You, you probably got an idea that, you know, I don't know where we're going to go this, this morning, all right? That's okay. We're just going to go for it, all right? I've, I've cut the string on the balloon and it's just flying up there somewhere. <laughs> but I meant, I meant to be talking about relationships. So why don't we have a go at that and see how we get on? And I'll tell you why. Because today I'm not so much sharing my sermon with you, I'm sharing my heart with you. It's going to be a little bit of a fireside chat because we're preparing for a series in January and February. And honestly, we've been preparing for months, talking, praying, planning this program of January and February. We have been doing this for months. Why? Because the need to navigate relationships successfully is so big. So, so big. If I can put it like this, we are a church of people on a journey of healing and recovery. I doubt if there is one person in this room that has had a smooth ride in relationships in their life. If I said, and I'm not going to, but if I said, put your hand up if you've either had a broken marriage or you come from a broken home or you've had broken relationships or, um, you know, uh, experienced relationship trauma or abuse or neglect or something like that, I, 
I bet you pretty much every hand would go up. Because that's the world we live in. And then we come to Christ, and he forgives us our sin, and our, you know, our sins are washed away, and we have a hope in heaven. But you know what? I'm still living here in this broken world. And it's great to know I'm going to heaven, but I've got to make a success of this life. And Jesus wants to manifest his glory in earth, not just in heaven. And one of the most difficult, challenging, practical, pressing issues is relationships. You know, churches don't split over doctrine. Believe me, they split over relationships. Offense, entitlement, pride, anger, upset. Now, they they can camouflage with issues, but... The prayer of Jesus and the exhortation of Paul and Peter and the letters is this. Love one another. Love one another. Not debate till you agree on all your doctrine. But preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. By this will all men know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. This is the challenge. It's easy to argue about doctrine. Anybody can be right. Anybody can claim to be right. You know, you, you've got your rightness and you believe the scripture. And every, you know, I mean, all, all the cults use the Bible. <laughs> you know, they all believe the Bible. The devil believes the Bible. It's, that's the easy part. It's working out relationships. And, and every week we're confronted by need. I, and I don't mean out there, I mean in the church. You know, we're pastoring people, we're loving people, we're helping people with their children, with their marriages, with their finances, with their, with their issues, with their stuff. And we became so... Pressed by this, we thought, you know, we have a responsibility to disciple people how to get on in their marriage, in their home, in their, with their children, with their parents, with their neighbors, with their, you know, with, with one another. How to form a relationship and and have a successful marriage. We have a responsibility to train our young people to to prepare for marriage and life. We're going to talk about that in January. First week, I'm going to talk about marriage. I'm going to answer the question, what is marriage? First Sunday of January. I'm so excited. I want you all to be here. Young people, I want you to be here. Teenagers, I want you to be here. You're not too young. You need to hear it. Because there's so much nonsense spoken out there about marriage. We want to speak the truth and the word of God because because this. Nobody gets married with the intention of getting divorced. Nobody brings children into the world with the intention of having a broken home and a broken family and everything just crumbling. We do it because we believe in it. Why do we get married? Because we believe in it. There's an ironic story about Elizabeth Taylor, the great actress. She she married seven times. And after six failed marriages, she announced her engagement. I can't remember the last guy. Somebody will remember. He's a businessman. And somebody said to her, Elizabeth, why are you getting married again? And she said... Because I believe in marriage. (laughs) It's like ironic, but I get it. You know, she could have just moved in. But she said, no, I've got six failed marriages, but I still believe in marriage. You know, I, I actually have some respect for that. I respect that. I want you to know we believe in marriage. We believe in family. We believe in successful parenting, and 
This is really important. Now, I'm going to read um, an extract from a, a newsletter. Ursula and I, and I encourage you to do this, we, get, we, get Christ, we support Christian ministries. And we, I, I get a number of newsletters from people like Christ for All Nations, you know, um, Daniel Kalenda, um, different gospel ministries, different um, family ministries, and we support them. And I encourage you to do that. Don't, you know, make sure, don't make all your giving come to LifeSpring. You know, yeah, you heard me right. You heard me say that. You heard me say that. Don't, don't make LifeSpring the limit of where you give your finance. So into child sponsorship, so into evangelistic ministries. I mean that. Set up some standing orders, like five pound a month, 10 pound a month. We both do that. We each, we have joint accounts. That's marriage. You, when you're married, you're one, you have a joint account. But we each have a separate account so we can give stuff. You know, so I have ministries that, I'm, that are passionate to me. Ursula has ministries that she's passionate about. So I have standing orders and I give. And one of the ministries we, we support is Care for the Family, Rod Parsons. And I, I want to read his Christmas, a little bit of his Christmas newsletter because uh, this is an amazing ministry. And we support it actually as a church. We've hosted Care for the Family events here and we are a friend of this ministry. So, dear friend, it was in the early 80s, I was a joint senior partner in a legal practice, and Diane, his wife, and I had just finished a meeting in our home of the Strugglers Group. That gathering had been born out of one of the most difficult periods of our lives together. Diane had been ill for a long time after the birth of our son Lloyd, and we had struggled in our marriage. Life was hard, but as we began to slowly come through those times, we started to share our experience with others. As we did, we discovered people wanted to talk with us about issues in their own lives. They didn't come to us because we had all the answers, and certainly not because we had a perfect marriage or family, but because we had been honest about what we were experiencing ourselves. They shared with us the troubles in their relationships, their worries about their children, their difficulties in coping with loss, bereavement, their fears about the doubt that was slowly stifling their faith. It all started with Diane saying to me, there's so much need out there, I'd like us to start a weekly group where people could come and share their pain and fears. It won't be a place of quick fixes, but we will be there for each other. Excuse me, I just get emotional about anything like this. I, I'm just a big softie. And so the strugglers group was born. Each week, people crowded into our home, all sorts of people with all sorts of backgrounds, employed, unemployed, doctors, plumbers, single people, married couples, those with kids, those without. The group continued to meet for years. I remember saying to Diane, what, why, why do you think people come? She pondered and said, because they are a bit broken, and so are we. They know we understand and because we listen. It was like one Wednesday evening, Diane and I were washing up the coffee mugs after the group had left. And I said, can you imagine what it would be like to start something like this group? Not just with a few people, but with an organization that could touch the lives of thousands. It was not many years after that conversation that care for the family was born. A global ministry was born out of two people opening their hearts and their lives and their homes to others who were struggling and creating a safe space and an environment where people could come. They could be understood and they could be helped. Now, I want you to know that's our value. That's our goal. You see, it's easy to come here on a Sunday and feel this incredible atmosphere of triumph. We sing these songs. The other week we sang that song, you know, um, about the goodness of God. Oh my gosh, I thought 
we were going to rapture ourselves. You know, people were pumping the air. You know, people were just shouting and jumping at the declaration that, that, that you know, God, he never gives up. He's always faithful. You know, he's, he's good all the time. We sing these songs and we believe it and we live it and we go for it. But we're not under any illusion. We are work in progress. And the, the, the challenge is this, that we mustn't create an illusion for people when they come in, what an amazing church, and how do these people do this and live like this, when I know full well, and my wife knows full well, and Del and Ronnie, and Dan and Laura, and a lot of us, we know full well that you've just had a row in the car on the way here. <laughs> We know things didn't look pretty over breakfast with Junior, you know, and you weren't even sure you'd get out the house to make it to church. We know, you know, we know this stuff goes on. Why do we know that? Because it happens in our house too. Oh, pastor. Oh, I can't believe you said that. <laughs> I'm not... I, I'm just trying to explain that there are, there are two sides to this. We believe who we are in God. We know who we are. We are ch children of God. You know, we, we, are, we're, we are living in victory. We, we are walking in grace. We are walking in victory. We're walking in identity. We're secure in that. But we also know we live in a broken world and we're on a journey and we have to bring these things together and, and we, we want to create a church. You know, on the one hand, we're not all like, it's not just like need focused and oh gosh, life's so bad and hey, all of you that are just struggling, just come down the front and we'll pray for you because we know how bad things are. Oh no, we're not like that. We, we put down the plumb line we're children of God. We're on the victory side. We're overcomers, right? Amen. That's who we are. That's what we believe. And while we are rooting ourselves in that, we're going to be really practical and really understanding and create safe space so we can help each other. I hope I'm making sense. Okay. Some years ago, something happened, which was really, really powerful to help me in this journey. It was at the time when we were on our own healing journey and going deeper in the love of God and trying to navigate what church should look like, how we bring these things together. And I was in America. I was in the northern states. I was uh, traveling and visiting uh, some meetings and meeting with some pastors. And so, uh, I visited uh, Wheaton College in Chicago, went to see a, a, a professor there who's a, who's a friend, and I had some time at Wheaton College. And while I was there, I went to a, a very, well, I'll tell you, it doesn't really matter, Willow Creek Church, great church. Bill Hybels pastored there many, many years. And Willow Creek Church was, was renowned. I mean, it still is today. It was renowned for being, you know, the, 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 the place, the seeker-sensitive movement came out of Willow Creek. And not without its problems or issues or challenges, but what I, wanted, what I want to do is explain what happened that morning. I went to their service, big, big church, you know, thousands of people there. And I went to like the 11 a.m. service. Amazing place, amazing service. And I, and I found my way down like four or five rows near the front in the middle section because I like to get right in the thick of it, and made my way along the row, sat next to this couple. And we're chatting and we're talking, and in the middle of the service, there's an opportunity to connect with people, like we do sometimes. And I, they said, oh, where are you from? I said, oh, I'm from the UK, I'm visiting. Oh, that's so nice, you know, we love people from England, and you know, Americans always get confused with England and the UK. They think it's the same thing, but anyway. <laughs> so 
It's hard enough for us to understand the politics of our country. But anyway, so we love England, you know. Yeah, we, we love England. We've been to Glasgow and, and Cardiff. No, no, that's not England. Yeah, we love England. No, no, no. forget it. Don't try and explain. Doesn't matter. And, and uh, I said, well, tell us about yourself. Uh, you know, you've been in this church long. Yeah, yeah, I've been in this church a while. Um, anyway... It transpired, I'm sat there next to this middle-aged lady and gentleman. And uh, you married? Yeah, have you been married that long? No, just a few years. It's our second marriage. Oh, really? Um, Yeah, she said, it used to be me up there. What do you mean? She said, I used to be on that platform. I was the um, wife of the assistant pastor. No kidding. She said, my husband was unfaithful. We ended up having a divorce. I've remarried, and here I am. I said, I, I've just got to get my head around this. So you're, you're still in this church. This is your second marriage. I'm sat next to you guys. You used to be like leading meetings, preaching. Yeah, and now here you are. With your... I said, can we have lunch together? <laughs> So we had lunch together, and they told me this story. But it wasn't just their story. What I learned was something about the state of our society and how the church has to position itself to meet the the real needs. She said, I said, how on earth did you navigate that journey and without shame and, you know, to get married and just be in the church and with all the people that used to know you and everything, you know, and just reinvent yourself like that. She said, oh, no, you don't understand. She said, one third of the people in this church have had broken marriages. She said, this is a church where we offer hope and healing and recovery. And that's why it's so full. That's why people come, because they know There is hope. She said, it's full of broken people who are in recovery, whether it's drugs, alcohol, broken marriage, abuse, whatever it is, because church should be a place. Of hope and healing. If, if you think church is a place where we're going to judge people, this isn't the place for you. This, God's the judge, not your pastor. My job is not to stand here giving the law. Oh, pastor, you, we can't be easy on sin. I'm not easy on sin, believe me. But repentance is a gateway to restoration. We don't shoot our wounded. We heal them, and we get them back on the front line. I hope I'm making sense. I hope you're understanding where I'm coming from. We all come from different backgrounds, and some of us have associated church with with like rules and judgment and not being good enough. None of us is good enough. (laughs) No one is good enough. What we need to do is take off pretense, take off unreality, take off religion, and get real and be real about our struggles, about our hopes, about our failings, to find help, to find healing, to find restoration. The fact of the matter is, already in this church, some of our most beautiful couples who have responsibility and leadership, some of them are on their second marriages. Why? Not because we believe in easy divorce, but we believe that God can make all things new. That's what we believe. That if you had a divorce... Or if you've had 
an affair or if you've committed adultery or if, if you've been involved in, in pornography or, some, or addiction, that it's not the end. Forgiveness is complete. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. And when he cleanses us, he removes shame. He doesn't put us on the shelf. He doesn't say, well, that's it. You know, yeah, I'm, I've forgiven you, but I'm not going to forget what you did. Oh, no, sir. He makes all things new. And this is so fundamentally important. And I haven't even shared anything that was on my notes, but, but I'm, I've just got to, I've got to wind this in somehow. We are preparing for the Relationship Matters season. And we are here to encourage and equip. And we want everyone to catch this vision and to embrace the opportunity of learning together and growing together. And as pastors and leaders, we have a responsibility more than that, a mission and a mandate to equip people to experience and enjoy wonderful marriages, strong marriages, strong families, raising children you know, that, that are resilient and strong in this world. Why is this so important? Let, let me read... We should read a scripture together. Psalm 78. Just going to share for just five more minutes and then we'll finish. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ear to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old which we've heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, what? That they should make them known to their children, that we should teach our children, that the generation to come might know the children who would be born, that they might arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. You see, there is a demonic, devilish assignment to destroy family life through political movements, ridiculous ideologies, through the devaluing of the role of fathers and mothers, the confusion of gender, Redefinition of marriage, laws that strip out the, the, the advantage of getting married economically, all of that's gone because we can't, you know, we, we, we can't have laws that um, are biased against people who are cohabiting. You know, we can't do that. And so people don't even know what marriage is. It's been so devalued. And Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes but to steal, to kill, and destroy. And he has his heavy artillery on fathers and men and manhood, on women and wives and motherhood, to mock and scoff. If, if a woman decides to stay at home and bring up children, you know, you poor little thing. And, and scoffing and mocking and demeaning the role of parents so that we hand it over to the state. Guys, I'm telling you, it's the parents' responsibility to bring up children, not the government, not the schools. Our responsibility. And if they cross their, the line, they'll hear from me. God gave me as a father the responsibility to bring up my children, and I'm not going to hand it over to the school or to the local authority or to the government. And we have to stand in this day 
and know the truth and know what God's word says because we have to build a strong alternative society because all of their grandiose ideas are crumbling because we have mental health crisis, physical health crisis, economic crises, family crises and breakdowns because people have abandoned the old ways of God. But we are not throwing in the towel. We are not abandoning the truth of God's word. And that's why we are doing this series. And we need you to catch this vision and this heart. Guys, it's not for someone else. It's for you. It's for me. It's for each and every one of us. And I've run out of time. I've shared my heart as best I can. But I'm, what I'm doing is paving the way for January because Christmas is upon us. We're going to be having lots of fun and festivities and sharing the Christmas message. But I had to get this message in before January. You had to hear from me, our heart for you, that we have a vision and a responsibility to build strong families for multi-generational blessing. God is a father. He's the father of every family. And the church can only be strong if the building blocks in it are strong. And that's the family. And it doesn't matter where you are in life. You might think, well, this is not for me. You know, I've had my kids and I'm just on my own. This is for you. We need mums and dads in the church. We need aunties and uncles. We need spiritual mothers and fathers. We need role models. We need help. We all need help. And this is all hands on deck. So please take that flyer. Pray over it. Have a look at what is relevant for you and get signed up. You can sign up anytime now. Don't wait till January because in the blink of an eye, we're going to be there and we want you to catch this vision. Amen. All right, I want you to stand to your feet. We're going to close in prayer. Now, whatever you're doing and wherever you are, I want you to to put down whatever you're doing and I want you to focus on me and I want you to close your eyes and, and you're the only person in the room right now. It's you and Jesus. You and Jesus. God brought you here today because he loves you. He sent Jesus to die a cruel death on the cross to take away your sin. No other religion has done that. No other religious leader has done that. They will all tell you what you need to do to be fit enough for heaven. But God sent Jesus, and the Bible says, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did what we couldn't do. He became the substitute so you could be forgiven, so you could have a clean conscience, so that you could know the love of God, so that you could go to heaven for eternity, so that you could have eternal life and not be condemned to eternal death. He loves you. He's speaking to you. He wants you to give your life to him. And I want us to close our eyes and pray this prayer. If you want to receive Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. I did that when I was 12 years old. That's a long time ago. I've never regretted a single day. The love, the peace, the joy, the knowledge that I'm forgiven and the presence of God in my life. There is nothing to compare with it. The peace Hallelujah. Peace with God. So Father, I pray that you will touch hearts and lives today. This is a day of salvation. This is a day of reckoning. This is a day to get serious about our lives, our marriages, our families. But it starts with knowing Jesus. So if you want to give your life to Christ, pray this prayer after me. And let's all pray it together out loud. Okay, ready? Heavenly Father, thank you that you love me. You love me so much. You sent Jesus to die on the cross to take away my sin 
so that I could be forgiven and I could be born again. I come to you now. I lay my life before you. I lay my sin down, my pride, the uncleanness of my mind, every word and deed spoken in rebellion. I give it to you and I receive your forgiveness through the blood of Jesus. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for coming into my life. Thank you for forgiving me. I receive you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now put your hands up and say, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for loving me, Lord. Thank you for coming into my life. Thank you for hearing me. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want you to give me a wave. Give me a wave. There's a man right here. This man here. Who else? Two there. One at the back. A lady there. Anybody else? There's a man, young man over there. Anybody else? Amen. There's somebody over there. Right. This is what we're going to do. All of you that raised your hand, without delay, come down the front right now. Somebody's coming to meet you and be with you. Give them a clap. Come on. Come down the front right now. We want to pray with you. Give them a clap. Counselors, ministry team, please come. Dale, Ronnie, come and help. Anybody else? Anybody else? Amen. Amen. Okay. Worship team, please come up. Ministry team, come to the front. Please make sure everyone who responded has got someone to pray with them. We're going to take your details, give you literature, pray with you. This is the best thing you could have possibly done in your life. Wonderful. And if you need prayer for healing, if you need help in your life, help in your marriage, help in your home, help in your family, we're here to stand with you. We love you and God loves you and we want to bless you. So we're going to have a time of worship and ministry. Enjoy the presence of God and you're welcome to respond. The ministry time is open. Thank you. God bless you. Amen.